All right. Good morning, everybody. So we've been talking about imperialism and what the type of imperialism we've talked about up to this point, I would describe as political imperialism, where one state, be it Britain, be it the United States, be it France or Germany or Russia or Japan, conquers other regions. We talked about how the British are going to conquer parts of Africa, South Africa, and Egypt. They're going to colonize Australia and New Zealand. That's what I would describe as political imperialism. They're going to conquer India. The United States is going to conquer Native American lands. They're going to conquer land from Mexico. They're going to purchase Alaska. We're going to conquer Hawaii, and we do conquer Hawaii. And we're going to conquer Cuba and the Philippines. Japan is going to conquer Korea. So these are, this is the typical traditional type of imperialism we talked about, where empires are conquering other states. And again, in period three, why are empires able to do this? Because they are industrialized and they're conquering non-industrialized regions of the world. That's what makes it imperialism in this unit. Well, there's a second type of imperialism that we're going to see in this unit for the first time. And it's called economic imperialism. Economic imperialism is where you don't actually conquer another region. You just completely control them economically. So you're running the economy even if you don't actually 100% rule them. An example of economic imperialism that we've already looked at is the United States and Panama, where we cut a deal with the Panamanians. They declare their independence from Colombia. They sell us the Panama the territory to build the Panama Canal at cheap price, and we're there controlling their economic systems immediately afterwards. France is going to do this in Southeast Asia in this time period. Um, let me add an example, one more example here too. Um, Britain, France. In the Ottoman Empire. So let me just tell you this story real quick. Whoa. <laughs> um, know why I forgot to put this one on there. So there's going to be individuals in the Ottoman Empire who are going to try to pass reforms, which reforms mean industrialization. How do you industrialize if you don't have the resources to it to do it? You borrow lots of lots and lots of money from Britain and France. Well, industrialization for lots of different reasons never catches on in the Ottoman Empire. One of the big reasons being Muslims don't want to go schlub in a factory for 12 hours a day. That's the antithesis of what a Muslim wants to do. Muslims want to be artisans. Muslims want to be fine, want to be merchants. Muslims want to follow in the footsteps of the prophet. There's nothing honorable or glorified in the Muslim faith about working in a factory. So the Ottomans build these factories and these railroads trying to promote industrialization that they didn't have the money to pay for by borrowing money from Britain and France, when they couldn't pay their bills, they had to give Britain and France enormous amounts of economic control of their state. So while in name, the Ottoman Empire is independent, in reality, the Ottoman Empire's economy is being controlled by foreigners. And those foreigners are making policies in the Ottoman Empire that are gonna benefit them. But the best example of um, economic imperialism in this period is going to be what European powers, most importantly Britain, do to East Asia, specifically China. Now, if you will remember the last time that we left off with Britain, um, last time we left off of Britain, not Britain, I'm sorry, China. China was controlled by the Qing Dynasty. In period three, two, in period two, we said the Qing had ushered in a period of peace, stability, and prosperity in China. We said if you lived in China in period two, 
and you looked around at your neighbors and you thought that China was in their traditional place of power globally. You thought you lived in the most powerful, prosperous, economically developed state on earth. But I told you, those sunny days are going to end and end quickly. There's dark clouds on the horizon by the end of period two. All throughout period two, we said that China had been um, economically isolationist. They were not involved in these great global interactions that are taking place. They were far, they were not interested in taking on foreign culture. We talked about what happened with them in Christianity in period two. And the bottom line is they had stayed stagnant and allowed European powers, maritime empires of period two to grow into tremendous, grow tremendously. By 1750, the start of this power, maritime empires like the British had been exploiting global resources for 200 years. Now, on top of that, a place like Britain is going to be um, is going to be industrialized. So that's going to increase their power even more. What does Britain want going into period three? They want access to Chinese markets. They're making all these goods. They want places to sell them. They want to sell them in China because China's got the world's largest population. In 1793, famously, the British send, by British, I mean the British East India Trade Company send an envoy named John McCartney. McCartney is going to lead a mission called the McCartney Mission to attempt to get the Qing dynasty to open up for trade with them. The Qing emperor refuses. The Qing emperor is going to continue the Chinese policy of economic isolationism. Very famously, he calls the British East India Trade Company's representatives white barbarian dogs. Get out of here, he says. We don't want anything that you have. We don't. Ha we don't want anything that you're peddling. You're lucky that we're letting you leave with your lives. Do not come back. You are not welcomed here. But what the Qing Dynasty didn't realize in this period, start of period three, is the British are going to trade in China, no matter what. They are asking permission in 1793 the permission is denied but that's not going to keep the british from trading in china so if you can't trade in britain in china legally the british east india trade company is going to begin to trade illegally in east asia and the million dollar question is what are they going to trade <coughs> excuse me and that's a good one what does China have that the British want? The traditional luxury items, silk, porcelain, and tea. Remember, what's the fancy stuff that's hanging in your grandmother's dining room? We call it China. Brit Chinese porcelain, some of the most famous on earth. If you stop to think about it, what is the traditional beverage of the English people? It's tea. What do they drink it out of? Fine porcelain that came from China. This is how much the English want to be in this Chinese trade. Well, what do the British have that the Chinese want? That's an interesting question. What happens is while the British are trying to get into China, the British East India Trade Company is conquering South Asia, India, and Pakistan, and parts of the region of the modern day country of Afghanistan. When the British conquer these regions, they discover a new resource that they can potentially exchange, and that's opium. Now, what is opium? Opium is a highly addictive drug. The Quattro, please tell me that the British aren't going to start the world's first illegal international drug trade to get into China. In the 1820s, the British start the world's first illegal transnational drug trade in China. The British East India Trade Company starts smuggling opium 
into China. Now, this is not legal. It is very similar how drugs get snuck into our country today. You had Chinese drug dealers, you met with them in port cities, you snuck it in, you sold the drug dealers, the opium dealers. But again, very similar to what's happening today. The opium, and they would then sell it to the people in under very shady methods. This is going to cause China enormous problems for two reasons. Number one, kids, drugs are bad. Opium is highly addictive. And over the course of 20 years, you're going to have enormous, increasingly large part of Chinese society becoming addicted to opium. Number two, traditionally, when China sold their luxury goods, silver, porcelain, tea, what were they getting in return? They were getting things like Spanish silver or Indian cotton textiles or Roman gold. Now, in exchange for their precious luxury goods, they're getting a drug. The wealth of China is literally going up in smoke. Remember that one. I'm proud of that joke. That's a good one. Anyway, <laughs> so my daughter's here. She's enjoying this. Eventually, a Qing Dynasty emperor goes, you know what? Drugs are bad, and this is killing us socially, and it's killing us economically. We need to do something to stop this. So he begins to crack down on this illegal drug trade. He starts to go after Chinese drug dealers. He starts to find warehouses of opium that have been secretly stored in port cities. He has his agents burn them. Uh, he executes drug dealers. Well, when this Chinese emperor had the audacity to try to put an end to the British East India Trade Company's drug trade, this became a problem. So they need to do something. De Quattro, please tell me that the British don't fight a war to keep an illegal drug trade going. In the 1830s, the British <laughs> fought a war to keep an illegal drug trade going. It's called the Opium Wars. Britain is going to attack China simply because China's like, hey, can we stop a drug trade? But here's the real takeaway at, from this. When in world history would a little island, six thousand miles away from China ever have the chance to attack China successfully. That sounds ludicrous. And yet the British are going to be able to do it. Why? Because of industrialization. This story I'm about to tell you, more so than anything else, shows the gap between how much more advanced Western Europeans had become over the course of 200 years of exploiting global resources through maritime empires and now industrialization. How on earth does Britain defeat the Chinese? There's 20 times more Chinese people than there are in the British in England, and they're a zillion miles away. How on earth do you beat them? Actually, it was pretty simple. You sail your navy, which now has steamships, to China. When you get to China, you split the Navy in half. One half of the Navy goes up and down the Yellow River, just destroying everything with cannons and artillery. The other half of the Navy does the th same thing up and down the Yangtze. And with steamships and modern weaponry, the Chinese people were powerless to stop. And without those avenues and resources to trade and to get things from one part of China to another, the Chinese people and cities are starving because they can't get food from rural areas to the cities. They also go up and down the Grand Canal, just destroying infrastructure left and right. Later on, France will join it later opium wars and the moral of the story is this the Qing are forced to 
beg Britain and later on France to stop these attacks. What do they have to do to guarantee that these attacks will, won't, that will stop? They have to make concessions to the British. The Qing are going to be forced to sign a series of treaties that they will call the unequal treaties. That's not good. If someone's signing a treaty called the unequal treaty, someone's getting screwed. And in this case, it's the Chinese. And what the Chinese are forced to do with these treaties is grant the British and the French and later on other European powers and Japan what are going to be called spheres of influence, territories that those powers have economic control over and the right to trade in those regions. And since the British were there first, they got the most valuable regions for trade, places like Hong Kong, if you know the story of the British controlling Hong Kong for 150 years. That comes out of one of the opium wars. So on a map, in theory, the Qing still ruled China, but in reality, these powerful European states, later on Japan, are coming in and they're forcing the Chinese to allow them to trade, honestly, against their will. One of the rights that foreigners receive is the right of extraterritoriality. That's a fancy word, which just means that if you're a British and you're in China, and you're in the sphere of influence to British control, you can do whatever you want and the Chinese can't prosecute. Theoretically, you can do something as awful as, awful as murder somebody. So this is how in name you're free, but in actuality, your, um, your economy is being controlled by outsiders through spheres of influence that come out of these treaties, these unequal treaties. Now, we have a big picture political belief with China. What do people claim when things are going bad in China? They claim that the emperor has lost the mandate. And we've said that whenever this happens, this will frequently be used as a justification for rebellion. This is a very Confucianist idea. Well, by the 1860s, things are going terrible, and you're going to see a massive Chinese rebellion take place against the Qing. It's called... The Taiping Rebellion. It's a massive rebellion against the Chinese Qing Dynasty. Interestingly enough, it has its roots in Christianity. In the 1830s, a Chinese, a European missionary had gone to a very rural village in southern China, and a young boy converted to Christianity. This boy is going to grow to eventually believe that he is the Asian little brother of Jesus Christ. And he's going to create a form of Christianity that is not going to be widely acknowledged by outsiders because it's very, 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 very different in its beliefs. Um, and I'm not going to get into all the things that the Taipings are going to believe in, but he starts a movement called the Taiping Movement, where he's wanting to create a Chinese society based on social equality, including for women. It's a movement that's very, uh, by the standards of the time, not very patriarchal. But long, long, long story short, by 1850, the Taiping Movement had gained enough followers that they launch a massive rebellion against the Qing. And it's a long rebellion. And it's a bloody rebellion. And 20 million Chinese are going to die in what is essentially a civil war. By contrast, the American Civil War is taking place at the same time. And I think it's something like 700,000 Americans die in the Civil War. Just think about how the, the Taiping Rebellion is not one of the bloodiest civil wars in world history. It's one of the bloodiest wars, period, in world history. That's incredible. And it was an internal Chinese rebellion. So long story short, in the 1800s, China is in deep, deep, deep trouble. The Qing are ultimately able to put the Taiping Rebellion down. Why? 
because they sold their soul to the European devils. In order to put these rebellions down, they promised even more concessions to the Europeans. And the Europeans really wanted the Qing to win because things were going well for the Europeans. They didn't want anything to upset the apple cart. So they'd start to provide military resources and assistance in helping the Qing put down this rebellion, which eventually they're able to do. But China is in deep trouble by the late 19th century. After the Taiping Rebellion, you see a movement in China called the Self-Strengthening Movement. The Self-Strengthening Movement is a group of reformers, similar to what we saw, we're gonna, we saw in Japan. That's like, guys, we have got to do something. Foreigners control our economic systems. Our people are suffering. We just had this terrible civil war. We've got to fix this system. We have to modernize, and modernize means industrialize. We have to change our social customs. We have to change political systems. We've got to move forward, or else these European rules are going to tear us apart. Fundamentally, is a movement to try to become an industrialized power. However, this reformist movement is going to be blocked. It's going to be blocked by the Confucius scholar bureaucracy and the emperors themselves. The people who are in power don't want changes to the system because they see it as a threat to their power. And this movement never really gets going. Yeah, there's a factory or two that's built. Yeah, there's a railroad or two that gets built, but not on the scale that it needs to happen. You need to remember that in many of these non-industrialized regions, it's the elites that are blocking change because they don't want to see any threats to their power or changes to the power. And remember, this would be an example of conservative Chinese scholarly bureaucrats who don't want to see changes because the existing system is benefiting them. Chinese emperors who don't want to see changes because it benefits them. So people who believe in the self-strengthening movement in China, we would consider them to be the liberals. And in this case, the liberal reformers cannot get China to move forward because of this conservative opposition that was so deeply entrenched. Eventually, China tries to fight back against, against the European powers that were there. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 1890s, a secret underground society was formed in China. It's called the Righteous and Harmonious Society of the Fists. Let that one wash over you for a second. What is the dream of the righteous and harmonious society of the fists to drive the European powers in Japan out of China? But here's the problem. This movement, which was primarily a Chinese peasant movement, doesn't have guns. So what do they have? The martial Arts wax on, wax <laughs> off. De Quattro, please tell me that the, these Chinese peasants aren't going to attempt to drive out Europeans with modern weaponry with their bare hands. The Chinese peasants attack European imperialists, the Japanese and Americans primarily with their bare hands. Europeans didn't realize and understand what these peasants were doing. They didn't understand what the martial arts were. So they called them the boxers because that was the closest equivalency to anything the Europeans had seen. And this is known as the Boxer Rebellion. It was an attempt by the Chinese peasants to drive the Europeans out. Now you might say to yourself, the Quattro, for the love of God, what made the peasants think that this could work? One of the beliefs of the peasants were 
if they were pure of heart, they were immune to European bullets and they would not be struck down. And what you see happen over and over and over in China is this, a very large group of people, large peasant, your peasants would attack a Chinese, a Chinese, um, a European, excuse me, outpost. Several thousand might attack an outpost with a couple hundred sold European soldiers. It could be French, it could be British, it could be Japan, Japanese, it could be um, American. Hold on just a second, I gotta check this out. All right. That was quick. Um, and they would attack, and the European soldiers, the industrial soldiers behind these in these forts would go, wow. Has a lot of dudes coming at us. They look mad. Those are some sweet moves. Is that the flying crane? Oh, cool. <laughs> and then they'd get within like 100 yards of the fort. And they'd be like, hey, Billy, fire up the machine gun. By 1900, Europeans had machine gun technology. And it's just mowing boxers now. It's so sad. This is this is one. This just shows you how desperate the Chinese were to drive the Europeans out. That you would believe that something like this could work. That you would think that something like this could actually be a success. And this just shows in such stark contrast how far China has fallen in this time as a result of their policies of isolationism in period two. I told you in period two, China would pay for their policies of isolationism. And that's what happens. 200,000 boxers are killed in the Boxer Rebellion. Counterintuitively, it fails. And ultimately, this is going to lead to the collapse of the Qing dynasty, and China's just pretty much falling apart by in this unit. So, that's our big picture story of economic imperialism. Remember, I've given you one example of it in great depth, but you also see it in places like the Ottoman Empire and in Central America with the United States and Britain controlling economic systems. It's not just here. This is the best example of it too. Hope you guys are having a great day. Um, I will give you guys your work in class to do in just a moment.